good afternoon. My name is Sister Noor Nasser. Uh, I'm an American citizen, uh, born in a suburb of Chicago, Illinois, called Evergreen Park. And both of my parents were born in Chicago, Illinois. My mother's side of the family was Roman Catholic. My father's side, Protestant. This caused uh, some schism in our family, uh, rather unspoken, but nevertheless present and felt uh, in my youth and growing up. Uh, one of the uh, temperamental issues, as I recall, was the Catholic Church had a law at that time of not eating meat on Friday. And if you did eat meat on Friday, it was considered a mortal sin. Uh, Adultery is a mortal sin. Murder is a mortal sin. Uh, with regard to eating meat on Friday, I was always nervous when I went to my father's sister's house uh, on Friday, perhaps for dinner, hoping uh, and praying for that matter that I wouldn't be served meat and be in an awkward or embarrassing uh, situation. Uh, of the six children in my family, I'm the only child that attended the public school system. The rest of my brothers and sisters went to the Catholic parochial schools. Uh, on Sunday, I went to the Catholic uh, catechism classes. And in one of those lessons, uh, there is a highlight that stands out to me. Uh, and a nun was teaching this class. And she was teaching us how to pray. And she taught us to pray first to Mary. And then Mary would ask her son, Jesus Christ, and then he would ask his father. I went home thinking about this order of prayer and sat alone for some time in the living room of my family home and thinking deeply about this. And then I just made a very conscious private decision. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going straight to the boss. And that's actually a quote of my thoughts uh, at that time. As time uh, went on, uh, I was about 17 or 18 years old when the Pope uh, of the Roman Catholic Church changed the law on eating meat on Friday. This was something very significant in my life because since it was classified as a mortal sin uh, in the Catholic Church, you are required to go to confession on Fridays, confess your sins and receive absolution for these sins. Technically, if someone would have eaten meat on Friday and committed a, this mortal sin uh, and did not make it to confession to confess this sin, they risked uh, going to the hell fire in death. When this law was changed, I was astonished actually because uh, although I revered the Pope as the leader of the Catholic Church, as all Catholics do, nevertheless I, I thought it uh, rather bizarre, actually, that a human being, although a very pious human being, would have such authority over the eternal fate of a human being. Professionally, I became a legal assistant. Um, my work was in the field of real property law and management for 15 years. Uh, I mention this only because reading became uh, a large portion of my life and reading the law and what it says and what it does not say. Uh, during this time, my, there is uh, a significant thing that happened in my family. My youngest sister uh, died suddenly, all within nine days. This is something that prompted all of us in our own way. We were living in different states by this time, and it prompted all of us to kind of go our own way and search out, bring ourselves closer to our Creator, God Almighty, religion itself, and to uh, try to find the answers that we were searching for. For myself, I married into the Lutheran uh, Church, a family, a Protestant family connected to the Lutheran Church, I should say, 
And the first time I ever saw someone reading the scriptures, the Bible, was my mother-in-law. She used to sit daily at the dining room table, stirring a cup of tea and reading the scriptures. So I began reading the Bible and then I became acquainted with the difference between a Catholic Bible, which contains the Apocrypha, as compared to the King James Version uh, of the Protestant uh, scriptures, as well as other versions of the Protestant uh, scriptures. I started to inquire regarding the differences of the Protestant churches. As an example, what makes a Presbyterian a Presbyterian, a Lutheran a Lutheran, a Methodist a Methodist, a Baptist a Baptist, Northern Baptist, Southern Baptist, Missionary Baptist, uh, Church of God, Church of Christ, uh, Assembly of God, the Pentecostals, Seventh-day Adventist, and etc. I think there are approximately 200 different denominations. So as a hobby in my life, uh, when I found free time, I was collecting either the church books uh, to study or going and listening to sermons, taking the sermons home and dissecting them myself, taking what the pastor was saying in the sermon back to the scriptures and uh, trying prayerfully uh, to find the truth and the path and uh, where the differences lie, the dividing lines between each of these denominations and why. And so I, over a period of 10 years in my life, I was very heavily involved in this. This uh, manner of study was not uh, anything like just taking a textbook and studying it. I considered, had great respect, respect and still do for all of the scriptures and so I would do this in a very prayerful manner. First, I would fast and pray. I would present the subject that I was interested in studying uh, to my God and ask him to give me the truth on this subject. I was using a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, which takes uh, you back in the Old Testament to the Hebrew language, which for every English word in the Bible, takes you back to the Hebrew language word and the original definition of that word. Uh, as far as the New Testament is concerned, it would take you back to the original Greek or Aramaic word and the original definition of that word. So I loved doing these studies. It was just like feeding myself spiritually. I was attending revivals and seminars. And one day, I pastor came to the door of my house who is the pastor of a Jehovah's Witness uh, church. And he gave me some material. He did not come in, uh, but he gave me material to read. And I had already been a little bit familiar with the Christian sects that are classified by mainline Christianity as heretics. Uh, it stood out to me in the material that the Jehovah's Witness uh, pastor gave me that these people did not believe, as an example, in the doctrine of the Trinity. One of the last uh, subjects that I, I wanted to approach, and by this time I had acquired uh, an array of notebooks filled with subject studies, and uh, one of the last uh, subjects that I wanted to delve into uh, just to satisfy myself, uh, was the subject of the doctrine of the Trinity. I had stopped at a Baptist church in the mountains, and the pastor was kind enough to give me some seminary documents on the subject, as well as church history. But I had not yet sat down to do my own homework, so to speak, as I was used to doing. My prayer life was influenced at this time by a German man named George Mueller, who lived in, uh, his work was in and around the 1840s. He was born in Germany, he migrated to England, and as a work of faith, he established homes for orphan children in Bristol, England. I read his, both his prayer diary uh, and his life uh, works. What stood out to me mostly was his, uh, the thrust behind his work. 
He started this work because in the middle 1800s, uh, both orphan children as well as poor children were being kept in the prisons in England. And he decided to challenge the scriptures. He wanted to uh, convince his people of the day that there really was a living God. He took uh, a scripture that comes out of the New Testament where Jesus Christ uh, says, when you pray, go in the closet and shut the door behind you. Make your request known to God in secret and he will reward you openly. So I began praying like this, keeping my prayers very private and trusting my God to answer my prayers. And that's exactly what he was doing. I have uh, an example of this, that I was home alone in my uh, beach home at this time. I was going six months in the mountains, six months uh, by the sea. And I was home alone for two weeks. My husband uh, was on business out of town. And I had a black Doberman Pinscher dog. I was planning to visit my grandmother on this particular evening. And I decided before doing that that I would take the dog out for a run on the beach. I took the dog out and the dog ran almost a mile down this beach. The beach was very wide. The sand was very loose and soft. You could not follow any footprints because they were lost in the sand. So after I got down to the end of uh, where the dog was, uh, suddenly I realized that I had lost all of my keys, my house keys as well as my car keys, somewhere on this beach. And I felt actually sick, especially since I was home alone. And I looked out over the sea and I made a prayer. And this was my prayer. I said, Dear Lord, I know that you know where my keys are. And if you want, you could send your holy angels to help me to find my keys. So could you please do that? And then I began walking back toward the house. It was just before the setting of the sun in the evening. And I got oh, uh, a short distance, maybe I would say what you would call a block away from where I would turn on the path to go to my house. And suddenly I just stopped. And by this time I, I, I just felt really disgusted, almost sick. I looked out over the ocean at the horizon and then I just dropped my head and this far away from my right foot, about two inches, two or three inches away from my right foot were all of my keys. So I had such a strong prayer life uh, and answers from my God that really nobody could tell me that my God did not exist. Uh, Something else I would like to mention, and that is that in and around this time, I started becoming convicted that I should have some kind of a covering on my head, especially when I prayed. Uh, I even went to the trouble of going to uh, one of the Protestant churches, which at that time in the neighborhood, uh, or not too far away, was called an independent fundamental Baptist church and I talked to the pastor at the church about this subject. His response to me was that, no, 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 you don't have to uh, cover your head. Your hair is enough of a covering for you. I went home and I went back to the scriptures on this subject, including uh, a scripture, uh, a text in the Old Testament with regard to a Nazarite uh, woman's vow to God. And I just became convinced that I didn't agree with this and I thought at least I would cover my hair when I prayed. So uh, around this time life changed and I went to Egypt with my two children. Uh, Initially, I got involved through my first landlady in Egypt. I got involved with uh, reorganizing uh, a home for orphan children. 
So I was invited to this through the mother-in-law of my landlady. I visited uh, the home and actually this home was being uh, funded by a Finnish uh, uh, organization in Europe and I met the people, they invited me. They actually, they were going to close the doors to this home at that exact time and I just happened to show up. So uh, they allowed me to uh, take in two assistants, Swedish girls, who are wonderful helps for me. And I had the freedom to reorganize uh, this home. In the course of that work, these two Swedish assistants were on the third floor in the kitchen one day, and they happened to ask me, have you ever heard of a man named George Mueller? And I said, have I heard of George Mueller? He's one of the reasons I'm here. And they opened a magazine of theirs from Europe and showed me aerial shots of his homes for children in Bristol, England. And from the readings that I had always done, I wondered if these homes still existed. When I completed uh, this work, uh, which, thanks uh, be to God, uh, turned out to be a, a successful work, uh, the people from Finland came and uh, everyone was very satisfied uh, with what happened uh, as far as the reorganization uh, of the home was concerned. And uh, I was moving on to other uh, things in my life and I had an experience one day uh, I was by this time in Egypt I want to say from the time I should have said this a few minutes ago but from the time I came to Egypt I felt very convicted to not only cover my hair when I was praying but that I should have some kind my God wanted some kind of a cover on my head so I was using a, a triangular scarf it could have been any color at all and I was tying it behind my hair uh, perhaps my bangs were out not necessarily a, a complete cover at all but it was on my head from my heart for the sake of my God and this one day I was going out I was in a taxi and uh, just running errands actually and uh, the taxi driver happened to look at me through the rearview mirror and said something rather astonishing to me because the rules in Egypt are pretty strict and especially at that time perhaps even more so than now uh, where the drivers are it's not usually considered polite for the driver to even talk to the customer in the back seat. They take them from point A to point B and, and that's it. But this driver spoke up and, and he, he said uh, these words to me. He said, I want to marry you. And so I was completely shocked and rather embarrassed. And I kept saying, shh, shh, and waving my finger like this. No, no, shh, 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 like this. But he didn't stop and he kept repeating this and I started to feel very uncomfortable, a little bit afraid. And uh, so when he came to a large, what we call a medan, which is an intersection, and in Egypt it's not just four streets coming together, it's like a pie cut <laughs> in, in many pieces. And he came slowly around the curve and I said the only Arabic word that I knew at that time, uh, that I had heard up at the pyramids, and uh, that was bass, and it means stop, like enough. So I said this, and at the same time I said bass, I said stop, and I opened the door and I got out. I went kitty corner across this medan as quickly as I could, and I jumped into another taxi because I was a little bit intimidated and felt, how do I know maybe this uh, man is going to follow me? So I went home. The next morning when I was making my prayers, I was troubled about this situation. I had considered myself uh, conservatively dressed for a Christian uh, in Egypt. I was wearing uh, long skirts, that, but they might have been a couple of inches, about like this above my ankle bone. And I was usually wearing these three-piece outfits uh, with a top and maybe another uh, jacket, but it might have been three-quarter length sleeve. Uh, instead of full length sleeve and uh, wasn't paying too much attention to the neck and was just tying my scarf behind my head. But this morning when I said my prayer after what had happened the day before, 
I was sitting down on my knees and I started to uh, commune with my Lord and I said, uh, Dear Lord, could you please show me the kind of clothing in your sight that is pleasing for a godly woman to wear? Those were my exact words. The same day, first of all, if anybody would have asked me how I thought this prayer might be answered, I was, would be quite confident and say, I'm sure he's going to show me one of the sisters, uh, the nuns from the church. But to my surprise, the same day at two o'clock in the afternoon, I was strollering my boys uh, out for a walk and we stopped at a bookstore. And a Muslim woman approached me in the bookstore. She was very intelligent and she spoke fluent English. Uh, she was wearing, it was the month of March. I used to say this story and think that it was the month of February, if anybody has heard this story before. Uh, I ran into an old journal of mine and have to correct it because it, it was uh, early March. And she was wearing a wool, uh, what is called a galabea, which is a straight uh, dress, long sleeves with a white scarf on her head. And she was carrying a little girl in a fluffy little white dress with patent leather shoes uh, in her arms. And the astonishing matter was that in the course of our conversation, she is the one who approached me. She was asking me where I was from. She was asking me if I was married to an Egyptian, which I said no. And uh, in the course of this conversation, she said exactly these words. You can see by my clothes that I am a godly woman. Well, I was completely shocked because this was exactly the language that I had used in my own prayer that morning. And I went home after this, and the next time I was on my knees praying, I lifted up my hands and I said, but dear Lord, she's a Muslim. <laughs> it wasn't too long after this that an American woman with her two children moved into a flat above me. And I was living in a very noisy area. Of course, Cairo and its immediate environs are full of traffic. And as the life goes in Egypt, it's around the clock. So the people don't sleep early. And it, I found it, the noise level, very annoying for myself. As I mentioned earlier, I was used to living in the mountains and by the sea. So I was waking up listening to the birds in the morning and the ocean crashing in. And now I am listening to traffic and toot, 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 toot all night long. So I started praying about and considering uh, moving out of the immediate city right at the time that this American lady moved in the flat above me. She invited me to come out to a village area where there was a Christian school on a compound with a church, and it was on a Saturday. So I brought my children with me and we went out there and had a lovely visit with the people. And while I was out there, I asked the pastor of the church who was Egyptian, although there were Im Americans and as well uh, also Filipino teachers on the compound, having been invited uh, by this American lady and uh, with her two children uh, to this Christian school, church and compound uh, out in the countryside of Egypt. I enjoyed myself out there that day so much and the quietness, the entire atmosphere was beautiful and the people were lovely. And so I requested that the pastor of the church out there, who was Egyptian, uh, please look around in the village area and see if he could find a villa for me to rent. I heard that the other people thought I must be crazy to consider living outside of a compound where all of the amenities are shipped in and, and they feel that they have all of their security and so forth, and understandably uh, so. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I'm a rather independent person and I was looking for 
uh, a simple villa. I told him it doesn't have to be anything that elaborate. I'm very handy myself. I can do a lot of things. Uh, maybe you'll find something that's been closed up uh, that can be reopened. Uh, please scout around and see what you can find. At that, I went back to Cairo, Heliopolis is where I was living. And after a couple of days, I called the pastor and he said he had uh, a villa for me to see. I went out and I saw the villa. There was no money discussed at all. I simply walked in and I walked out. I left. Uh, the owner of the villa was an Arab man who I have never seen in any other clothing except a Galabea. Very sharply dressed. He would be considered as the chief of the village, so to speak. And so I was in and out, went back to Heliopolis again. And after a couple of days of prayer and consideration, I called the pastor and asked him, would you please go back out to that villa and find out from the owner how much he is willing to rent this villa for? I did not mention any figure of money at all. And he did. He took his engineer with him and they went out to the villa. And in the course of conversation, the owner told him that he was in partners on this villa with his brother-in-law. And the two of them were interested in 1,500 Egyptian pounds. Uh, we're, this is in the middle 1980s, just to let you know the period of time that we're talking about. And I was at home and I had been, at the same time that they were out there talking to the owner, I was in my flat in Heliopolis in prostration, begging my God to give me a sign if it was his will for me to make this move out of the city. Uh, it was a little bit intimidating, a little frightening, because I was a woman with my two children, uh, and uh, I'm not as familiar at all with the uh, culture out in the village areas. Uh, so I wanted a sure sign from my God that it's a go. And so I made one of my usual prayers and asked my God actually in this prayer for a sign, a very specific sign that if it was his will for me to move from the city to this particular villa, let the sign be that the owner agrees to rent me this villa for 800 Egyptian pounds. If he says 825 Egyptian pounds, I'm not going. Now, I was told later from the pastor of the church that when he got out there, the owner and the brother-in-law that he was in partners with said they needed 1,500 Egyptian pounds. Nobody knew about my 800 pounds except myself and God Almighty. And in the course of the conversation, there's traditions over there and they sit down and there's the greeting and they have the coffee and then they talk the, the business. And in the course of the business uh, conversation, he came down from 1,500 pounds to 1,200 pounds and he actually finished at 1,000 Egyptian pounds. And the business discussion was over. I was told later that it's very uncommon once the business discussion is closed for it to be reopened by anyone. So at the end of this, they were leaving, the pastor of the church and his engineer who was checking out the condition of the home. And they were walking down this patio, and, which was a rather long patio with a grape arbor. And they were at the gate, the front gate of this villa. And suddenly the owner stopped them and said, just a minute, just a minute. You tell that e American woman, I will rent her this villa for 800 Egyptian pounds and not a piesta less. From that sign, I moved to this villa. And uh, in the course of meeting the families in the immediate uh, area, I was sitting with a mother uh, with her eight children, 
and we were eating. And uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with there is a low table in some of these houses, which is called the tablea. And we sit around it and eat. And this mother uh, was taking very good care of me. Uh, she was letting me know when it was being translated to me that she was very surprised. She said, um, all of the women, all of the women have their suitcases filled with dresses, dresses, but not you. Books, books, books. So in the course of this visit, they were so welcoming, so warm. Uh, but something very unusual happened, and that was the oldest son in the family, who spoke most of the English, uh, because he had uh, graduated from Al Azhar University, uh, he popped up and said something. As I said, we were not talking about religion, nothing. We were just having a general visit, and suddenly he spoke up in a very rather uh, firm, straight, voice and said exactly these words. This is a quote. The God is one, and Jesus Christ was a great prophet, maybe even the greatest, but he was not the son of the God, and he was not an equal with the God. Stop. That was the end of what he said. I remained silent. Now, by this time in my life, I had been to so many Christian seminars and done so much uh, studying. I was a very strong and rather, uh, not extremely so, but rather conservative Christian. If you saw my Bible, you would see that where I held it, uh, where the book is open, on the side where it's open, I had held it so much that the leather was all worn on it. It was a King James Open Study Bible, and I had all kinds of notes in the margins, uh, and I was, quite frankly, if anyone who knew me as a Christian, they would never, ever imagine that I could become a Muslim. Now, exactly one week after these words were spoken to me, and I should also add that when these words were spoken to me, I felt my heart struck. I remained silent because I knew very well that I ha was carrying enough knowledge that I could give this person a short sermon uh, as the Christian, any Christian pastor would teach the subject of the doctrine of the Trinity. But if I was honest with myself, which I chose to be at that time, uh, I knew that it was this subject that was the last of what I was really wanting to study before I left America and came to Egypt and didn't find the time to do. So I knew I hadn't done my own personal homework on this subject. So I chose to remain silent. Exactly one week later, I was invited back to the home of the Christian family on the compound. The father, this elderly couple, he was the principal of the school. He was also a math teacher. While I was in my home, in their home with my children, I was admiring a full wall of books in his house. And center and uh, a little bit higher than halfway up the wall, uh, I, my eyes focused on the Quran. And I was very surprised that this man had the Qur'an in his house. I have never seen a, a Qur'an and didn't know really much of anything, although I was sitting there in Egypt in a population of over probably 95% Muslim. Uh, I didn't know anything about Muslims except that I knew that uh, there was a call for prayer that was going on on a regular basis, on a daily uh, basis, and that Muslims made a pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia. Uh, I knew that. I didn't know anything else about their religion. And um, so I said to the man, oh, you've got the Quran. And he said, yes. He took it down, sat down in his living room, and at random just opened it. And he said, a, a family from Lebanon about nine years ago gifted my wife and I with this Qur'an. He said, I've glanced at it a couple of times, but I'm not interested. I won't be reading it. If you want, take it. 
So this is how I got the Quran. I never received the Quran from the Muslim uh, community. I took this Quran home. And because a week earlier, the statement that was made to me, I decided this is the time for me to finish my homework on the subject of the doctrine of the Trinity. I began two weeks of prayer and fasting, which was my, not necessarily always two weeks, but I always did prayer and, and fasting. It was my usual routine before approaching any subject because this is, this, these are the scriptures and this is a spiritual matter. And it was my own personal experience that the combination of prayer and fasting brought down a great deal of power from my God into my life. So uh, the owner of this villa had, uh, and his dear wife had offered myself uh, the exchange of going to a brand new villa that they had built in uh, Alexandria at any time I wanted for a change of environment. So this was very kind of them. I took my two children and my servant with me and I went to Alexandria. While in Alexandria, I was planning to spend one month and to focus in my free time on this subject matter of study. So in the evening, when I put my children to bed, I would spend the night studying. At the end of this month, uh, and by the way, I want to make something very clear. Prior to going to Alexandria, I had only opened that Quran one time, and it was in the dining room of the villa. I, I regret to say that I cannot remember what I read, or what the uh, surah or the ayat number, which you, uh, most people, Christians know as chapter and verses, uh, I have no recollection of what that was. I had just randomly opened it. But whatever I read, I remember instantly, tears came down my face. And I knew only one thing. I was reading something very straight. So I took, I did take that Quran with me, but my study of the doctrine of the Trinity, I didn't trust this book at all. Uh, as far as I was concerned, my Bible was the word of my God. So I am planning and to do this uh, study of the doctrine of the Trinity based on the Old Testament and the New Testament, using, as usual, my Strong's Exhaustive Concordance to go back to the original language and the meaning, uh, the original intent uh, of the meaning of the words. So in the course of this study over the month, uh, I will just give a few highlights of this right now. As an example, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the prophet Moses, may Allah be pleased with him, is calling Bani Israel. And he says, Hear, O Israel, for the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. As the commandments come down to the prophet Moses, uh, they begin with belief in God Almighty and clarifying that he will have no strange gods before him. Now in this study, uh, when we say, Hear, O Israel, for the Lord your God is one, that word one in the Hebrew language is equivalent to numerical one. It cannot be two and it cannot be three. Another highlight was in the New Testament in the book of James. James had become the early forerunner of the Christian church after the ascension of Jesus Christ. And he was calling the early Christians back to the faith of Abraham. May God be pleased with him. And as it comes down, it is uh, talking about uh, how Abraham uh, was uh, justified by both his life by faith as well as works. As it continues on, it makes a statement, and the God is one, and even Satan knows this. When I went back to the original language there, once again, the word one was equivalent to numerical one. It could not be two, it could not be three. Moving further then, of course, my mind is then 
uh, curious with regard to the language of the Son of God being used with Jesus Christ. And I found uh, something really uh, quite unusual for me. I had read my Bible so much, but during this study, I really believed with all of my heart by what was happening that my God was honoring the two weeks of prayer and fasting that I had, inve had invested before doing this study because there were scriptures that were jumping out at me, like to get my attention. Uh, on the language of the Son of God, I discovered by using Strong's Exhaustive Concordance again, going back to the Greek language, that this same language could have been translated to say, Jesus Christ, one of the full of God. Immediately I thought of the community of believers and how every prophet is a member of the believers. Uh, they are the highest uh, level of believers for that matter. And therefore, it never had to be translated or taught uh, in Christian doctrine as a literal son, an issue uh, of God Almighty. After one month of intensive study regarding the doctrine of the Trinity, it became my undeniable conclusion that the evidence showed that this great God that I was serving is one. I reached this conclusion at 3.30 in the morning. And I really don't have the words to describe how profound this conclusion was to myself. It was as if my entire foundation uh, was caving in un below me. Initially, I felt that a great mistake has been made by teaching that our God uh, has partners joined with him and his sovereignty being disturbed in that. And I was concerned for the millions of people who have been taught this doctrine. Then my feelings shifted from a, a great mistake to actually wondering, uh, after all, the scholars are very knowledgeable. Then my feelings actually changed and I began to wonder, I'm just telling you honestly, I'm not accusing anyone of anything. I'm just telling you honestly, uh, from the bottom of my heart, uh, the truth of how I felt. Secondly, I felt, uh, or have we been lied to? And nobody likes to be lied to. In the end of this, I went upstairs to go to bed and it was 10 minutes to four in the morning. I sat down on the side of a be the bed and just sat there with my hands on my legs, thinking. Suddenly, I turned my head to the right and sitting on a small table at the front of the bed, uh, which was like a, a small nightstand, was this Quran that had been given to me. I then said to myself, now I just want to read anything at all from this book. And I took this Quran and I opened it just at random. And my eyes fell. It has uh, Arabic and English as well as a uh, very thorough uh, English tafsir. It was a Yusuf Ali translation of Quran and an older one. It was uh, a double set in a uh, book uh, jacket. Uh, and as I opened it, my eyes fell to these words. God Almighty on the judgment day was questioning Jesus Christ. And he is saying, Jesus, did you tell the people that you are equal with me? And Jesus Christ is answering his Lord back saying, no, 
God forbid, never did I tell the people that I was equal with thee. At this my eyes fell down to the tafsir, and to my shock I read in the tafsir, which is the commentary, the exact same thing that I had just finished writing in my own notebook downstairs, my conclusion. That Jesus Christ, as mentioned in the book of Matthew, was a prophet. That he never called the people to worship him. And in fact, he never proclaimed himself as the God, he never called people to worship him, and in fact, he prayed to his God. I think I walked around in a daze for a couple of weeks after this, almost a semi-shock, we would say. At this point, all I knew was at this moment, uh, I'm not sure who I am, but I, I, I know one thing for sure, I am one giant step outside of contemporary Christianity. I returned to the village and I spent many months thereafter continuing comparative religion studies and taking the notes that I had on previous subjects, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, I had spent a period of about 10 years in my life compiling subject studies from the Bible. I continued these studies with, uh, on any given subject, uh, I might go from the, Tor from the Old Testament, Torah, into the New Testament, and then what does Quran have to say on this subject? And I found on a continuing basis that whatever subject I approached, it reminded me of the days in my youth when we were taught to fire bow and arrows in grammar school, and we would uh, try to get the arrow in the center of the ring. And I said to myself, if I took everything that Christianity, and I do mean this in a very respectful way, if I took everything that Christianity had to offer me on every one, any one of these subjects, and I fired it at the target, that arrow would hit here, or here, or here, or here. But if I completed the subject with Quran and something that is called the Sunnah, which is stories of the Prophet, and uh, not only stories, but what I consider as, uh, from a legal perspective of case history in Islam, I found that the, every subject was then refined, completely purified, and if I shot that arrow, I would be hitting a bullseye every time. Now, in this journey to Islam, uh, after coming to the conclusion of the oneness of God, the language with regard to the Son of God, uh, as previously mentioned. If the doctrine, if Jesus Christ then, as I was reasoning in my mind at the time, if Jesus Christ was then not the Son of the God and not a de uh, deified, then his shed blood could not pay for my sins any more than my shed blood could pay for your sins or your shed blood could pay for my sins. The whole supposition of the Trinity collapses. Subsequent to that, of course, the very next thing that a sincere uh, Christian is going to question is the subject of the crucifixion. Because in Christian uh, theology, uh, the path to salvation hinges on this shed blood of Jesus Christ, which being accepted by a believer is supposed to cleanse them of their sins. And in the course of this study, uh, my prayer, my continuing prayers were that if what this book says, meaning the Quran, if what this book says is true, then I beg you, my God, to give me evidence to support what the Quran says from the earlier scriptures. On the subject of the crucifixion, what stood out to me immediately from my Bible, and again, these were prayerful studies, a combination of prayer and fasting, and what stood out to me, first of all, was the story of Mary Magdalene. After the 
uh, which was supposed to be the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, she went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And in this garden, she sees a man. He proclaims to her, uh, fear not, Mary, for it is I, uh, Jesus Christ. And the point that stood out to me here was that Mary Magdalene did not recognize this man. It was a point of recognition. Uh, so in addition to that, I believe uh, it's in the book of Acts, the um, disciples were on the road to Damascus. And the so-called risen Jesus Christ was supposed to have appeared unto them on the road to Damascus. Once again, what stood out to me was that he was not recognized. These men did not recognize him as Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ that they had known. Thirdly, we have the story which is reiterated in the Christian uh, churches on a yearly basis, uh, which is titled Doubting Thomas. Thomas who was in the upper room and who, this, again, the so-called risen Jesus Christ was supposed to have appeared to him in the upper room. Thomas, who was one of the 12 chosen apostles of Jesus Christ, refused to accept that this person was Jesus Christ. Therefore, he also did not recognize him. Now, what was profound for me about this is that in the Quran, with regard, with all due respect and with regard to the subject of Jesus Christ, it says that Jesus Christ was not crucified, but that there was one who appeared like him. And it says, do not doubt this. The evidence for me was clear. And so I passed this subject with regard to the crucifixion. There are many other subjects that I uh, confronted in this journey to Islam, uh, particularly from a Western mind, uh, freedom of conscience, for instance. Uh, these things perhaps I will have another opportunity uh, to discuss. Uh, freedom, per se, and the definition of freedom, uh, freedom being central uh, to all Americans, uh, and what is freedom, and, and true freedom uh, that has its dignity intact. Uh, these subjects were uh, confronted in this journey. Finally, in conclusion, what I had found in Islam was a complete system, a legal system, that satisfied not only the requirements or the recommenda re recommendations for any individual person, how to brush their teeth, how to clean their bodies, how to live, how to protect themselves in the life, the family, the extended family, the community, and in fact, an entire system that included the law of the land. I also found a system that wasn't unique to any specific ethnic uh, group, but was a call to all humankind to come. In my, uh, the last piece of evidence that is very important that I don't want to uh, leave out here, uh, by, by this time I felt that uh, I had overextended myself with asking my God for too many evidences and I actually wondered if the roof might come down on me if I asked one more question because he had answered me perfectly with every question that I had. Yet, I had, if you will, the audacity to ask my God for one more piece of evidence. If this book is from you, the creator of the universe, please give me one last piece of evidence. And to my surprise, that evidence that was given to me was something scientific rather than something having to do with the articles of faith and comparative religion. 
And it was a verse uh, from a few years earlier. I had a booklet in my hand that was written by Dr. Everett C. Koop, the Surgeon General of the United States. The title of this booklet is called When You Were Formed in Secret. On the front of the book, it has the profile of a pregnant woman. Inside this booklet, uh, it has begins with black and white, uh, in the center there's black and white photographs, negatives, of day one of conception of any life, day two, day three, week one, week two, and comes up to two months. Uh, and I had remembered looking at these photographs from a few years earlier. Suddenly I found myself in the Quran reading a what's called an ayat in Qur'an, which uh, a Christian would know as a verse in Qur'an, that is talking about the formation of life at its earliest stages from conception. And one of, uh, part of this ayat, uh, translated into English, is talking about this blood clot. And then this blood clot changing into the form of a leech-like clot, Subsequently, a chewed leech-like clot. Instantly, what came to my mind was this booklet that I hadn't looked at. I ran to my bedroom and pulled out my briefcase from under my bed, opened it, took the booklet, and opened those pictures because I had remembered that's exactly what those negative photographs. It is a leech and looks like a chewed leech-like clot. Now, this information is secret information that only the Creator Himself could know. Almost 1400 years ago, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, the zoom lens was not developed. We didn't have this information. It was the deciding evidence for me that this book indeed came and has come down to mankind from the Creator Himself. And incidentally, it does say in Quran that God Almighty never allowed Satan or the angels to witness His creation. For myself, at this time, there was nothing else left for me to do except put myself in prostration under what I would call the umbrella of the law of my God. Submit myself wholeheartedly to the will of Allah in Islam, which means peace. The word Muslim means someone who submits themselves to the will of God. Therefore, in Islam, we believe that all the prophets were in fact submitters to the will of God and therefore Muslim. This was the decisive moment of me becoming a Muslim. Uh, in the course of these studies, uh, for reasons, I uh, took the name Nur, which means light. Nasr is the name of a surah uh, in the Quran, which means victory. Uh, Subsequent to this, I returned to the United States and I went to my mother. Uh, I was praying constantly at my mother's house for guidance from God as to whether or not I should say anything to my mother about who I was or, or what I believed. I, I was praying actually to my God that if my mother's heart is ready to hear this information, then give me a sign. Let her come to me. If she comes to me and asks me, I will say something to her. Otherwise, I will remain silent. One afternoon, I was in the middle of my prayers. I was in prostration, and she walked into my bedroom and walked out. A few days later, she came in. This is during a two-week period. Uh, she came to me at 7 o'clock in the morning, and she sat on the side of my bed, and she shook me by the shoulder to wake me up. And she said... I am so sorry to disturb you, but I just have to ask you two questions. And I said, well, go ahead, Mom. What is it? And she said to me, 
are you still a Christian? And what do you think about what the Christians teach that the God is three and one and one and three?